before we get started. Uh, a wife woke up one morning and said, Honey, I just had a dream that you bought me a new gold necklace. What do you think it means? I don't know, but Valentine's Day is coming soon. Tuesday, you'll know, he replied. A few nights later, she again woke up after a dream and said, I dreamed you gave me a pearl necklace. What do you think it means? He said, you'll know on Tuesday. The night before Valentine's Day, she woke up uh, telling him about her dream. This time, honey, I dreamed you bought me a diamond necklace. What do you think it means? Honey, be patient. You'll know tonight. That evening, the husband came home with a package and gave it to his wife. With great delight and anticipation, she opened it to find a book entitled, The Meaning of Dreams. So, honey, you'll know. A chief in Africa called all his men to come to his hut in the center of the village. It was his fear, he said, that there were no longer any real men in the village. He had the impression the men were being ruled too much by their wives. To find out if this was true, he asked all of the men who felt their wives bossed them around to leave the hut through the door at the right. Those who felt they were in charge at home should leave through the door on the left. Lo and behold, all the chief's men left through the door on the right except one who stood all alone. He firmly left through the door on the left. So the chief called the men together and gave a speech of praise to the one lone wolf. At least we have one real man in our village, he said. Can you please share with us your secret? The man looked rather sheepish, and at last he muttered, Chief, when I left home this morning, my wife said to me, Husband, never follow the crowd. Okay. All right, all right. I'll give you, I'll give you just one more, one more. A lady wanted to marry four different men in her lifetime. She said each one would help her with the four things she needed most. First, she wanted to marry a hedge fund manager. Second, a movie star. Next, a clergyman. And finally, a funeral director. When they asked her why, she answered, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. One for the money, two for the show. All right. Okay. We want to share with you just for a few moments a marriage on the rock. A marriage on the rock. The Word of God tells us, and what we're going to do, uh, we're going to just share um, just some insights from our 25 years. And I want to read from Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus said this, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. This morning, we would like to share with you a marriage on the rock. A marriage on the rock. If you could put that, that screen up there, that picture. A marriage on the rock. And we would like to share with you the importance of having spiritual truth, the principles of God's word, lessons from uh, the word of God and from wise and godly counsel upon which we can build our house. You've heard of the, say, uh, the saying, a marriage on the rocks. That's in a negative sense, a marriage on the rocks. But we believe you could build a marriage on the rock. We want to share with you what we're learning. 
I say that purposely because we're still learning. Hello? We have not learned as if to have acquired all the knowledge and all the understanding and learned this to a measure of perfection. We are still learning and growing. By the grace of God, God has helped us. We have tried to uh, live our lives according to the word. We've tried to pray and really seek God because the Bible tells us unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. We understand we have to put God first. Now, when it comes to marriage, and hon, I'm going to let you speak. When it comes to, to love in marriage, I believe there are basically three ways or three uh, means by which we learn about love. I think we learn by Hollywood. We learn by what we see on TV. We learn by what we saw role model to us in our home. And we also learn from our friends. Now, um, those are probably, um, as far as Hollywood, if you're taking your cues from the housewives of New, New York, New Jersey, Orange County, or Atlanta, you're in trouble. You can't take your cues from Hollywood because they are not building upon the rock of obedience to the word of God. And it's very unrealistic. You can't always take your cues from your parents because sometimes our parents are not living and building their life on the truths of Scripture. My experience was my parents, they didn't have the greatest relationship. Uh, there was a lot of yelling and screaming in our home. I've also had family members that were divorced, and, and, and that was in my, my spiritual lineage, if you will. And without the grace of God, I wouldn't have any hope. But I learned at a young age as a Christian to build our lives, to build our marriage uh, upon the rock of God's word. I read an, inst an interesting statistic that only 90% of Christian couples pray regularly together. Only 90%. Brothers and sisters, please, we need to change that statistic. We need to put God first. We need to pray. We need to understand that we don't have what it takes. You know, we love each other. We loved each other from day one. But, but we had to grow in love. Again, biblically, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us the, 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 the definition, the true biblical definition of what love really is. Now, let me just say aside, for some of you that maybe are divorced or going through some struggles in your marriage, what, I wanna, what we want to share is something that you could look towards the future with. You know, God wants to prepare you for, for a, a future day, but you have to understand that there are principles and there are foundational truths that you have to build to have stability in your life because the Bible tells us the wind is going to come. The rain is going to fall. The, the, the floods are going to come. And you need to be founded on the rock, which is Jesus Christ, and on the rock, which is the Word of God. Amen? Lisa. Um, yeah, so I, you know, was brought up in a pretty good marriage and, you pretty know, uh, parents, you know? pretty good home. And I saw my parents really committed to each other. And so one of the things that I have found is God helping us stay committed to each other. And um, it's true, the storms do come. If anybody tells you otherwise, um, they're not telling you the truth. And you need to be committed to one another and putting one another first. And oftentimes I hear advice that different people give to married couples, um, particularly young married couples. And, and you know, I, I've had some people come back to me and tell me some advice that they've received. And I'm thinking, wow, you need to totally not listen to that person again. Because a lot of the advice that you get from the world is, well, they did that to you, well, then give it right back to them. And that's not what God's word says. God, God's word talks about forgiveness. And so one thing that, that I have really um, trusted God for is being committed to each other. And, you know, as we go through some of these principles, I just want to add this. Yes, we're focused on marriage today, but these principles can also be taken into any relationship in right. your family, right. in the workplace, in Amen. friends. So don't, That's you know, good. if you're here and you're not married, don't shut us down. You know, take some of these principles also for your own life, too. Amen. Amen. And we're going to share with you an acrostic, uh, the word love, in each letter uh, of the word love, L-O-V-E, 
is going to be a, a lesson, a principle. Again, these are things that we are, we're still learning. We don't always hit the mark. We're not always 100% on this. But, but we're trying by the grace of God. And, and that's what's so awesome about having a relationship with God is that there's always hope. There's always the prospect of growth. There's always a future in God that even when there are tough times, and let me just say this as an aside, being a pastor, being pastors of a church add a whole nother intense dynamic to a relationship. And it adds a greater level of spiritual warfare and a greater level of stress and a greater level of difficulty and so uh, we stand here today boasting, not in ourselves, but we're boasting in the Lord. Amen? We're boasting in God. And you need to boast with us. Come on, somebody boast with us. Amen? Because it's not always the case. And I hear of too many statistics in ministry. And you know, at the end of the day, I want to be found as a man who loved my wife. Because I've heard of a lot of great men who've done a lot of great things. They didn't love their wives. They, they cheated on their wives. They stole money from the church. They divorced their wife. I want to be a man at the end of the day who loved his wife. And it didn't matter what everybody else said about them, but that my, my kids loved me. And that I was a man of integrity, a man who built his life on the word of God. Come on, somebody say amen. So let's start with the first L. Listen to each other. This is the principle of communication. One of the greatest challenges in marriages that I hear over and over again is there is a lack of communication. What we hear in counseling is, he never listens to me. She never listens to me. So help us. And, and the first thing that I thought of under this um, category was, we need to listen with both ears. And while we're listening, don't be thinking about what you're going to say next. Don't be thinking about your response. Don't be thinking about yourself and processing it through your own eyes. You have to, we have to listen to the other person and process it through what they're trying to say to us. And um, one thing that I've learned with, with my husband, with my children, and even with people is people will tell you how they feel. And we can't say to them, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Well, they do feel that way. You have to validate. And so in our communications, we have to validate each other. And even if we don't agree and, and if we don't, we don't think we made them feel that way, well, I guess we did because they feel that way. So communication has to be listening wholeheartedly and processing what they're saying through their mind and not through just what you think it should be. You know, I, I was watching something on, on TV a few weeks ago. It was a, uh, like a townhouse meeting. Uh, and they were talking about political issues. And what struck me was there was probably about, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 people in the room. And they, you know, the moderator asked them to raise their hand and talk. And they would begin to talk. And people in the other side of the room would begin to yell and voice their opinion and what they believed. And I looked at that and I said, this is chaos. Because it don't matter how valid anyone's point is at that time, nobody's hearing it. And a lot of times in, in relationships, we're all guilty of this, especially when there's a conflict. I've sat in conflicts with marriages, with church issues, and people just want to tell their side of the story. And they just want to get it out, and the other person's jumping in there. And I try, by the grace of God, we try in our, our relationship, let the other person explain themselves, even if you have to bite your tongue. Even if you have to let your tongue be red and bleed, let that person finish. Because if not, they're not hearing you anyway. And husbands, men, women, you just, just close your ears. Just block your ears right now. Men, let your wives talk. You will have a happier marriage just if you let your wives talk. Can I just say something on this? You're going to get it either way. So you either let them talk and get it all out, or they're going to eke it out. Right, guys? And we know how to eke things out. If you don't want to listen, oh, yeah, we're going to get it out. <laughs> we're going to make your life so unhappy until you let us talk. So you're better off letting them talk, letting them communicate, 
and, and then figure it out. It works better than eking. And, and understand something, men. Men are different than women. You know, years ago there was that book uh, that was written, uh, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. And, and the whole premise of the book, I never read it, but the premise of the book is how, how otherworldly, how so radically different we are from one another. Men are, are stimulated visually. Women audibly, or they, what they hear. Women need to, to, to talk. Women need to express. Women need to share. And, and, and you know, what I found in, in marriage counseling, when, when I sit down with a couple, I've learned over the years, the woman uses that meeting for the opportunity to express everything she's been trying to say to that man, but hasn't been able to. Hello? They, they sit there and they give me a history. They go back 30 years, 20 years. And I want to tell the man, don't let it go back that long. Listen to them. Keep short accounts. And so, again, I have had to learn that. I'm still learning it. And, uh, and what did you learn about timing? So what I've really learned is two things. Number one, it's not always what you say, but how you say it. And number two, timing. You could be feeling, and this goes for men and women, but I've really learned, particularly in my shoes being a pastor's wife, that Saturday is never the time to bring up anything contentious. Do you know why? Because he's preparing to come Sunday and feed the sheep. So if I decide on Saturday I'm going to let loose on him, he is not going to be able to be in the word like he needs to be. Now, I will tell you, the first several months of marriage, I hadn't learned it yet. And I wasn't interested in learning it yet. I wanted to say what I needed to say when I needed to say it. But I really learned, thank God. And I don't always do the, the, the right thing by this. And sometimes my, my emotions get in the way. But I've really learned timing is everything. Not just for the person that you need to communicate to, because it's not a good time for them, but also for you yourself, because you've got to process it. And, and let your anger or aggravation or whatever dissipate a little bit. And also give yourself time to process it and maybe think, maybe it really isn't right. that bad. And that's helped me over the years that I get to a point where I don't even know why I was going to bring this up right. to him. I don't that's, even need to. That's a great point. Yeah. I was going to mention that uh, there are times in the moment of anger, if we're not careful, we could say things that will really be very detrimental. And it is sometimes there is a there is something to be said about having a cooling off period. You know, there are times when I say, you know what, I'm just going for a walk. No, I don't want to talk about this right now. We will talk, right. but not now. Because I don't want to say things. And then after the fact, after a little cooling off period, like you said, it's like, it wasn't that big. How many of you know the devil could anoint something? How many of you know there's a demonic anointing? You know how the Holy Spirit blesses and, and makes words come alive? The devil could, could uh, demonically anoint something and inflame something so bad to enrage and cause anger and hatred. But by God's grace, God will help you and I to be different. Amen? Okay, O uh, in love is to overlook each other's faults. That's called forgiveness. Say a little something on that. First thing I think about this is whenever you feel offended by your spouse or another person, again, this is a principle we can take into all of our lives in any relationship, but when you feel offended and you feel hurt and you feel that they've done you wrong, sometimes you just have to stop and think about yourself and say, I'm not all that perfect either. <laughs> and that, that helps me because overlook means to look over and keep going. It doesn't mean overlook it and then come back to it and be combative about it. You know, we, we need to know ourselves too, and we need to know our weaknesses. So that has always helped me to let things go. It's not worth it, you know, and th not that we don't talk about, you know, things that bother us sometimes. But again, getting back to what we were seeing a second ago, sometimes you get to the point it really doesn't matter because I have my own faults that I'm sure he can list. Mm. And so sometimes it's just better moving past it, forgiving, and not even necessarily talking about it. Well, it says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that love does not keep a record of wrongs. And I think even in relationships in the church and in life, we tend to keep a list. 
of what, how people have wronged us. And, and we, we've got a list and we rehearse it and rehearse it and think about it. And, and all that causes is it doesn't bring about healing or, or, or forgiveness or, or restoration. It just causes a greater divide. And I think our culture is, you know what, and, and that's a lot of what's going on in, in, in our world today. A lot of the, the hatred and the anger is, you know, there's not, there's not forgiveness. There's not, you know, healing. There's just drawing battle lines. And, and, and we've got to love one another. And part of that is keeping no record of wrongs. But what we have to keep in mind is Jesus says, forgive even as you have been forgiven. Think about how you and I have been forgiven. Would you like us to put up on the PowerPoint all your sins? Yes, you would? Can you put hers up? I don't think any of us would like our sins to be broadcast to the world, but, but the Bible says, Jesus says, you will be forgiven as you forgive. So what proportion you forgive someone, that, that revolutionized my life. When I got that revelation, I realized, hey, wait a minute. If I'm not forgiving, that means God is, is, is not going to release me from some things. Forgiveness is a big thing. And in the church, sometimes people can be so unforgiving, they'll leave the church, they'll talk about you, they will not want to heal or restore, they'll just keep drawing the battle line. But, but we can't keep record of wrongs. We've got to ha- learn a word, I'm sorry. Anybody remember uh, Happy Days, the, 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 the Henry Winkler, the Fonz? Some of you from other countries, man. Remember, you know how hard it was for him to say the word? I'm I'm s s s He could never get that word out. It was so difficult. And some people are like that. They can't say they're sorry. But you know what? I have learned that's a magical word, yes. word with my wife. You know, if I say I'm sorry, that, that changes everything. But it's not. You know what? I find it very difficult myself. The way I was brought up, it's very difficult sometimes for me to say I'm sorry. I'm learning, I'm growing, and God's helping me. And so it's a, it's a, it's a two-word sentence that you have to say. I'm sorry, period. <laughs> See, what, what we've learned over the years, and, and I remember years ago, you know, we hadn't been married very long, and this thought occurred to me. I'm sorry, but, this is how you made me feel, I'm sorry, but, that wasn't right what you did. I'm sorry, but, I was only reacting to you. Well, you're not really sorry. What you're doing is you're opening up the door to use that as an opportunity to let them know how you really feel. What you need to say, what I need to say is, and I had to, you know, actually this week, I'm not going to tell you the who's and the what's and the when's and where's and why's, but this week I had to go to somebody and say, I'm sorry. Period. No buts. No excuses. No justification. No justifications. Just, I'm sorry. And it is amazing what speaking that two-word sentence will do when you just leave it there. Let there be silence. Let them respond. But just leave it at, I'm sorry, and it, and it really works wonders. Let me just say this last thought about forgiveness, and we'll move on. Um, forgiveness is a decision, but trust is a process. Forgiveness is a decision. You have to make a decision to forgive. But in a relationship, if the wrong is, is deep and severe and, and um, the issue is grave, then you forgive that person, but it doesn't necessarily mean you trust them immediately. Right. Trust has to grow. It's a, it's, there's a process to that. So just a clarification. Let's move on to V and value each other's uniqueness. That's called appreciation. I have learned to appreciate my wife. You know, we are so different. Not only man, woman, but she comes from Bangor, Maine. I come from Providence, Rhode Island. She comes from a different culture, um, French, something. I come from an Italian culture. Worlds apart, so different. Her, the way she celebrated holidays, the way we did, the way she viewed certain things, just so different. And, and you know, we're all prejudiced. Hello? We all think our culture is the best way to do it. Come on, come on, just loosen up. Some of you, some of you like, you, you, you think this is CNN or Fox News right now. Loosen up. We're all prejudiced. We all think our culture is the best way, and we celebrate our culture. You know, and, and I, I thought, you know, as an Italian, this is the way it was supposed to be done. 
But you know what I've learned as a Christian, as a pastor of a multicultural church? That every culture has something to offer. Everyone does something for a reason and there's something good about it. And I've learned such great things from my wife to appreciate certain ways she is. Even things that, you know, when we were first married, there were things that irritated me. Hello? Oh, God, I'm trying to help you this morning. You know, as a pastor, I say, it's so hard. It's not easy to get people blessed. You know, it really isn't. I have to work hard to get you blessed. But there are things that used to irritate me. Now, I think they're cute. Now, I think they're precious. Why? Because I appreciate her. You know what, the, you know what appreciation does? It adds value. Depreciation decreases value. When you buy a brand new car... You drive it off that lot, that's called depreciation. It's worth 25, 30% less. Once you drive it off that parking lot, it depreciates. The value drops. See, when you appreciate something, it adds value. When I appreciate my wife, when you appreciate your spouse, when you appreciate people, it adds value to that person. And everybody wants to be valuable. Amen? Someone once said, don't go where you're tolerated. Go where you're celebrated. And, 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 and if I'm appreciating my wife, she's appreciating me. What, what does that do when, when the enemy tries to come in with temptation? Yes. Oh, come on. Help, help me this morning to, to, to communicate that when we're appreciated, what does that do that, that makes us feel valued? We're not going out looking for value. So um, being, being from Maine, there was not even an Italian person, an Italian bakery. There was no Italian bread. So there was no Italian culture. And so I, I, when I first came to the family, I was brought up where the only yelling you heard was when you were in trouble. And they would call your name, including your middle name, and you knew you were in trouble. In this family, everybody, in the Italian culture, in this particular family, everybody's just yelling all the time anyway. And so one of my first experiences was my, not my mother-in-law then, but she, she became my mother-in-law and, and she spilled something and it was Sunday dinner and the whole family's there and everybody's talking loud and they're yelling at each other, but they're not really yelling. They're just talking loud to be heard over each other. And she spills something and she's yelling at me, get a mop bean. Okay. So I was brought up in a house that a mop bean, we never heard of it, but we had a mop. So I thought maybe she means a mop. So I went looking for a mop. No, 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 a mop bean, a mop bean. So, you know, I had to learn that a mop was a cloth to go clean the spill. <laughs> I had to learn that they're, they're, they just yell. And, but, you know, I was just thinking what's, you know, God is so cool because I was adopted from birth. My parents were very quiet and my, my, my two sisters were very quiet. So I was always the one that was getting, as a matter of fact, I was the one that was getting yelled at most of the time growing up. So I did hear the yelling, but it's so cool being such a different kind of personality that, that I am. I'm not quiet. If any of you, if, if you haven't known me very long, you will find that out. I'm not quiet. And God put me in an Italian family that's, you know, upbeat and, and loud and, and vivacious. And I don't know, that, that thought just came to me. So I think that's really cool. So the real me could come out. <laughs> God does have a sense of humor. Yes, he does. Okay, E. Well, let's go, go to E in uh, the acrostic. E is experience life with each other. And this is, speaks of togetherness and, and fulfillment. You know, life is not about things. It's about doing things together acquiring experiences, remembering, you know, those are the things you'll remember in life at, 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 at critical moments. You know, people, uh, people when, when they're on their deathbed or people when they're, when they're thinking about life, they don't talk about, remember when we bought this? They, re they talk about, remember that vacation? Remember that time we did this or that time we did that? And, and it's so important to experience life, to spend time with each other to reconnect because let's face it you know if we're not reconnecting we're going to get disconnected that's right. that's right and one really important thing is having a regular date night and we've always told couples it doesn't have to cost a lot of money because you'll say that to somebody and they'll and, and ministering and counseling with people and they'll say well you know what we have a tight budget get in the car and go for a ride grab a coffee, go to Lincoln Woods and take a walk, um, you know, do something, eat at home so that you don't have to have the expense of going out. But you don't, we don't want to use the excuse we don't have the finances. There's always something that you can get away from the house, get away from your children, and go somewhere and be alone. So you can do anything for a date night. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. And it's important. 
And it's important when you get out on the date, and believe me, we still deal with this. We have adult children and we're still doing this. You get out alone and what do you start talking about? The kids. Your kids. Or in our case, our kids are the church. So we have to look at each other and say, we're not going to talk about the kids and we're not going to talk about the church. We're just going to enjoy each other. And so getting mm. out alone often is very, very important for your marriage. It, it truly is. And, you know, we, we communicate. I think sometimes we joke, we over-communicate. We text, we call, we work, work together, together, and we're always talking and sharing. Sometimes we, we meet with couples or we know of couples that will mention something. Oh, I never told my wife. I never. And, and, and sometimes it's like they live in, in separate worlds, and, and you don't want that because you want to draw closer. You want to share your life. And, and with, with social media, even with texting, you can keep in contact when you're traveling, when you're in the day. Send, send little I love you notes. Send I'm thinking of you appreciate you. Those things mean so much and they help you to stay connected. Yeah, let me just add to that. In the, in the day of technology that we live in, if you don't know what a bitmoji is, it's not the little emoji, it's a bigger one and it's bitmoji. The, the, one of the funniest things that we do if we're having a little bit of an argument or, or whatever argument and he might not be home, I start scrolling through my bitmojis to look for one that says, I'm sorry. To look for one that, you know, the, the girl's just standing here like this. And, and I'm going to tell you, those things work. It breaks the ice. You know, breaking the ice a little bit. If he took a ride and I'm home, instead of stewing, you know, let, let use something like that to break. The, I'm not saying you should communicate all through social media. Don't get me wrong. Don't go out of here say, saying that I said, have your fight on texting. I don't believe in that. But I believe it's a good little way to break the ice in, in a situation. Years, uh, it was about a, a few months ago, we had a, a good little disagreement. Let me just say that it's amazing that our, when we first got married, we had some, some, some disagreements, some, some arguments, some fights. But as time went on, I can say, you know, they're far and fewer in between. Absolutely. Speaking to the mic. Absolutely, because we've learned. He wants me to make sure I'm agreeing with him. <laughs> yeah, hon, whatever you say. No, it's true. It's true. We have learned. First of all, you learn how to fight, even though you're not fighting per se, but you learn how to have a disagreement. It doesn't always have to get loud and, and start bringing up all stuff from the past. There is a way to have a disagreement and still be at peace while you're having the disagreement. And we've learned that. Thank God. Thank God. Let me just say a couple of things in closing. You know, I really want to emphasize that without God, I couldn't do this. You know, I didn't have the greatest upbringing. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, I didn't have some of the, the best of role models in marriage. Um, you know, and, and my, own, my own limitations, my own weaknesses, wherever I lack as a person. Uh, without God's grace, without his word, I, I wouldn't be here today. You know, um, unless the Lord builds the house. They labor in vain. And I have learned, I have had to pray. I have had to pray, God help us. And one last thought I want to share is, is the aspect of praying together. Uh, we've always had our devotional time, our prayer time on a regular basis where we, every, every morning, that's our time. Well, we pray, read the scriptures and pray because we realize, you know what? You can't walk in the spirit without prayer in the word. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, I want to speak to you as the spiritual, but you're carnal, you're fleshly. He was talking to the church. He was saying they were people of the flesh. They were people who were carnal. They were not really spiritual. He says because there were divisions, there were sectarianism in the church, they were boasting in one another. I mean, there was all kinds of confusion going on. And he says, I can't give you solid food, you're babes. And, and unless you're praying and reading the word, you're going to be a person of the flesh. Galatians 5 says you're going to be a person who, who walks after the flesh. But if you read the word, if you pray, if you, if you open yourself up to God and say, God, change me. God, fill me with your spirit. God, help me. He will make you a spiritual person. So we have, we have, we have over the years, 25 years, had our own times of prayer on a regular basis. You know, try to be consistent, not always hitting the mark, but overall done fairly well. But the last couple of years has it been where we have been praying more together. And I thank God for that. And I, and I share that humbly as a confession that we didn't always pray together. 
Husbands, pray with your wives. Husbands, pray. Take a few moments. And sometimes the women are more vocal and husbands get intimidated and insecure and they're afraid to pray. It don't have to be a long prayer meeting. It could be a few moments at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, just praying for, you know, Lord, Lord, strengthen my wife, bless my wife, encourage her, protect her from the evil one. We're in a spiritual battle. We've got to fight this thing. We've got to fight in Jesus' name. This ain't a joke. This ain't a game. We've got to fight. And so ultimately, when you, when you love each other, when you, when you uh, listen to each other, when you overlook faults, when you value each other, and, and when you experience life together, it, God adds his blessing. I'm going to ask Kelly to come and sing a song that was sung at our wedding. And I want to say that this was the, one of the highlights, if not the highlight, I believe the anointing of the Holy Spirit was upon this song. And I believe this was God speaking to Lisa and I as, as uh, you know, young, a newly married couple and also as a couple in ministry. And I want this song to be prophetic of God just speaking to you today, whether you're a married couple, whether you're an individual. And the, the title of the song is I Will Be With You. I will be with you in joy and in pain and your cry for mercy echoes my name now and forever I'll be at hand I will be with you I will be with you cause that's who I am I will be with you I'll be on your side Prayers for deliverance will not be denied. And I'll fight the battles that evil might wage. I will be with you, I will be with you to the end of the age. to feel 
Cause I'm ever so near I will be with you Just put your trust in me Always and forever Eternally I will be with you I will be with you For I am the Lord Amen. Let's stand together this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. What a promise. Come on, receive that promise for your life. I will be with you. God will fight the battles that evil will rage. Father, we thank you today for your goodness and your grace to your people. Father, thank you for blessing Victory Assembly of God. Thank you for blessing our marriage for 25 years. Thank you for blessing the marriages of this church. God, strengthen them and keep them. Father, thank you for every relationship, every individual here today. God, I pray that the seeds that have been sown would be in good soil and bring forth a fruitfulness and a difference in their life and in their future. God, we thank you for the truth of your word. God, we thank you for the rock of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the rock of the word of God. Lord, let it be so real to us. Let us build upon that rock our lives, our marriages, our ministries, our homes, our careers, our futures, everything upon the rock, Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you this morning.